Hi guys, welcome to Collective What an amazing journey we are going to travel together. Uh, thank you for continually uh, watching us on online for all our video sermons. I pray that it will greatly uh, empower and strengthen your walk and your life in Jesus Christ. So join us, be a part of us, whether physically in our church or online through the internet. May your life be greatly blessed this year. If you have your Bible view tonight, or if you look at your screen, uh, I'd like to take us to a journey by reading John chapter 13. John chapter 13, the Gospel of John. <clears throat> this one, as a church, our, the focus of our sermons uh, in the book of John. Are you all there? Is it on the screen? Uh, let me just read to you. Uh, this is the night where there were a lot of confusion, like what Jiahao and Alicia had to go through. In verse 1, uh, the Thursday night, the time that Jesus was going to be betrayed, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for Him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, is carried to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now that what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. Verse 11, For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I've chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to his disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping this, the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood what Jesus said this to him. 
Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Let us pray. Father God, we look to you tonight as we celebrate uh, Good Friday. I pray, O oh God, Lord Jesus, that every one of us will come tonight despite whatever that we have been through today or we've been, been going through in the last season and period of our lives. Father God, I pray, tonight we experience Jesus in this place. Tonight we experience you, God. Tonight I pray, Father, God, minister to us. Help us remember the, the value of the cross. Sometimes coming to church has lost its purpose because perhaps we forgot to worship God or to experience Him. But tonight, this is our prayer that whether you are seated from the front to the back, whether you are on the left, on the right, whether you've been a Christian for many years, whether you're a new friend tonight, I pray that there will be a reality of God, a reality of Jesus in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people say, Amen. Why don't you turn to one another one more time and say, Happy Good Friday. I want to take us to this portion of the scripture. You know, not very long from now, the entire narrative of humanity will take a turn. And the end of this story will forever be rewritten. The dinner table was ready. The meal was in progress. But the atmosphere was poignant, the mood somber. Strange that even at such a crucial juncture, the stage was set in a most intimate manner around a table and not in a coliseum or on top of a hill ready to be broadcasted all over the world. It was such an important event, not just to the 12, not just to the disciples, not just to the Jews, but to all humanity. That moment is the one moment that will change history forevermore. The contrast in the magnitude of what would take place, coupled with the constraint in space of where they were gathered together. And in their mind, because it was so restricted for all of them, created an unparalleled void of confusion. It must be so confusing to the disciples. It must be so difficult for them to understand what is actually going to happen in a short while. First stop, let's look at the washing of the disciples' feet. So he got up from the meal, the Bible says, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, 
are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, being Simon Peter, why don't you just not my feet? Why don't you wash my hands, my head as well? You know, just wash the entire me. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. If you look at verse 7, Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. It is difficult for the disciples. It is difficult for Jesus because what is happening? Firstly, you are the master, you are the teacher, you are the Lord, and suddenly you decide to take out, take off your outer garment and then gird yourself with towels and start to wash the disciples' feet. The scene is both powerful and important. And even more so, if we understand the context of the Jewish culture, do you know that the washing of someone's feet is the lowest of the low? That even a Jewish slave does not have to wash their master's feet. So even as a slave, you have to do everything for your master, but never need to wash your master's feet. And in that picture, in that context, now, turn around, is the master that is washing the disciples' feet. And Jesus, who is known to them as teacher and Lord, decided to wash their feet since no one was willing to do it for one another. So you got to imagine this in a setting of a typical Jewish culture, getting ready to celebrate the Passover. They, they live in a desert country. And so every day when they go about doing whatever that they have to do, they, they, their feet are always dusty. And so it is very rude if you have your guests that come to your house, like today, it will be very rude if your guests will wear shoes, go into your house and then sit on your sofa and then put their legs up. In those days, it's rude if you do not wash your guests' feet. And, and everyone was looking at one another. Everyone knew everyone's feet was dirty from the whole day's journey. But nobody was willing to wash each other's feet. they rather it is not being washed. This is powerful. Because remember when verse 7, Jesus said, you do not realize what I'm trying to do to you right now. Because unless I wash you, you have no part with me. The washing of the feet by Jesus is a prefigurement of the death that Jesus was going to go through in a short while. That it is through His death on the cross that He will wash away our sin. And without that death on the cross, you will have no part in me. So Jesus was not referring to literally to the act of washing of someone's feet so that they have to be a part of God's kingdom. Because if that is so, we should have water baptism and feet washing ceremony. But that's not what Jesus meant. He was talking about the death that He was going to suffer on our behalf. And this is also important because Jesus wants them to learn to love one another. When you know that the lowest of the low is to wash somebody's feet and you are willing to do it, then Jesus knows you are ready to love one another and to love the world that God has given to us. So they were not ready and they were not prepared at that point of time. Church, this is a powerful picture that the cross, therefore, is the way to salvation and the key to community found in sinners willingly humbling themselves to serve one another. 
You know, that's the Bible says that's the secret to community. The secret of the community is not whose house has got better food. The secret to a healthy community is not, you know, what you bring. The secret to a healthy community is not what we do together, whether you're the coolest kid in town, whether you're the one that watch all the cool movies, you know all the cool music. No, the secret to a healthy community is when we, all of us, realize how much we have been saved by Jesus Christ and we humble ourselves that we choose to serve one another. When you realize, when you and I realize that we are saved and we are willing to serve, then community is possible. The certainty of Christ in this whole setting on that night is such a stark contrast in comparison to their confusion. They were confused. There are so many hints in the chapter 13, the confusion that they were going through. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. Do you understand why I wash your feet? They have no clue. Lord, I don't know. Maybe you felt like doing it today. They don't know. They didn't know, right? Verse 22, on another conversation on that night, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of these he meant. So he didn't know why he was the feet. He didn't know which one he meant. But no one, verse 28, at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Jesus said, the person that I put the bread will be the person that will betray me. But, but they, him, Judas, how could it be? They thought perhaps the person that will betray Jesus is someone from outside. Verse 36, another confusion here. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? So you can imagine, right? For three and a half years, Jesus spent most of his time with the 12 disciples. They will go out together. They will go home together. They will pray together. And this Peter is the one that even saw the transfiguration of Jesus. And Jesus is at the very last moment of his assignment by now. <clears throat> He's not supposed to have simple questions being asked. He's now supposed to be at the part where he is tying up all the loose ends. I'm going, guys, in a short while. Hey, remember what to do, okay? It's like the parent leaving the house to their kids for the first time. Remember, son, don't open the door to strangers. If they know, if they tell you things that you, you they, they say they know your mom and dad, but just don't open the door. Those are the loose ends. But, Lord, where are you going? Isn't it trouble? Already three and a half years, they are asking Jesus, where are you going? I, I, when I read the Bible, I'm amazed by Jesus' patience. How, how could you, like, still answer so calmly? Have I not told you enough why I'm here? Have I not shown you enough signs and miracles and wonders and taught you from the Word, from the Scripture, why I'm here? And now, the eve of His death, they still did not know where He was going. Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Now, even more confused. So, like, where are you going? We cannot go now, we go later. Typical Chinese will be, oh, go later, later when? Next week, next month, or next year? Tell me. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? You, you understand or not? You, you, you understand the... I will lay down my life for you, Peter said. You understand the contrast that night? Jesus was at the eve of his death. He was preparing them and say, I'm going. And they're asking all these questions, seemingly oblivion to everything that was going on. 
The disciples were confused and lost throughout the meal. They didn't know who he was talking about. They didn't know where he was going. But I guess if it is us, we would be confused too. I guess if it is us, we would have a lot of questions at the same time. Have you ever been confused before? Like what Jia Hao and Elisha had to go through? It must have been very confusing. Until the very last moment, there was still heartbeat to the baby. Until the very last moment, the doctor said everything is fine. And, and they, have, they have been following Jesus, loving God. They must be asking, God, why is this happening to us? How many of us, we feel lost? We feel upset, uptight, agitated. We're angry. We lose direction in life and not knowing what to do. We're just stuck at a place. What course to take after SPM? Do I, should I go overseas or should I stay back? Whom should I marry? This is my dream job, but if it's my dream job, why am I not feeling very satisfied, very fulfilled? Is it too late to change? Am I too old? And all these confused questions, and I've been confused. I have been lost many, many times. And how do I know how to get the answer out of it? Actually, in fact, not just very long. Uh, this morning, I had a big battle in my heart. I was trying to go to uh, Subang Lutheran Garden to visit my dad, and I was in the car by myself. You know, Waze is amazing, but there were days where Waze cannot detect GPS. And uh, I was driving, so I'm not sure about you, when you're driving and then you see the line is here, and then you see the dot, do, 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 eh? Okay, never mind. Stop the car by the roadside, you know, turn off the ways, turn it on again, and then you see the red color bar, no GPS, approximate location detected. So, I try to fiddle and try to Subang Lutheran Garden, and still no signal. I call my brother. Is your ways working today? Or is it just my phone? He said, Oh, use Apple Maps. I'm like, got Apple Map one? Ah? Yeah, 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 like this. Okay, so I use Apple Map. Uh, Apple, I type in Sub Subang Lutheran Garden. I've been there before. It's just that. Uh, Apple Maps say, No results found. Your search cannot be found. I'm like, what is going on? So I, I, I was already on the highway after that. I had to stop on the roadside and there were like lorries and I, I don't know whether I can stop and there were police cars driving me by. So then I thought it was working finally because the dot is following the line. So I started driving again because the no GPS thing, red colour is not on my phone anymore. And as I drive, suddenly... <laughs> angry i was upset like why of all the places of all days this has to happen i was confused i was upset because my mom is going to go my family is waiting for me i don't want to be late i, I want to be there with everybody and sometimes in our confused state the answer is not loud and clear sometimes in our confused state the answer is not obvious. What do we do? And tonight, we want this Easter to be totally different because tonight is a call to experience Christ, to experience His certainty that when everything around us is uncertain, when we are confused and it's becoming very complicated, and it's becoming very hard to understand. We have to learn to trust and rely on the certainty of Christ because He knows. When I read this passage and I see the questions that the disciples ask, the answer that Jesus gave shown so much certainty. Verse 1, it says, 
It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Jesus knew. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Verse 11, for he knew who was going to betray him and that was why he, was, he said not everyone was clean. Tonight, some of us may be hurting. Tonight, some of us may be broken. Some of us may feel abandoned. But friends, I want to assure you that He knows. Jesus knows what you are going through. Jesus knows what is the trouble that is bothering you. And we got to learn to commit those situations to Him, to see how He will carry us through. And in that journey, allowing His Spirit to lead us and to calm us. The certainty of Christ creates a sense of control that leads to a certain trust. The certainty of Christ, when you know that Christ knows, it gives a sense of control that leads us to trust. Even later on, after that night's dinner, when Jesus was already handed over to Pilate, verse 10, Pilate was trying to find fault with Jesus because he has to have a reason to crucify this man. But Jesus was not cooperating the way Pilate wanted and said, if you have done no wrong, then you just say. Because if you say so, I have the power not to crucify you and you will walk away. The last thing that Pilate wanted was to crucify an innocent man. Verse 10, do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Verse 11, Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Jesus was so calm. He was trying to tell Pilate, hey, don't worry. It is not your fault. It's not your sin. What you have to do is something that was given from above. But those who handed me over to you is greater is guilty of a greater sin. Why? Why is it so easy for us to be not stable, to be confused, to be upset? I don't know, but perhaps our unbelief and our confusion are caused by our inability to see that Christ is in control of whatever situation you and I are going through right now. Or maybe, or maybe, we have taken control instead of Christ and we realize that we cannot trust ourselves. We have decided that, hey, I'm in control of my life. I'm in control of what's going to happen. I know what to do. But then suddenly you realize you cannot trust yourself. The certainty of Christ also creates a strong sense of confidence. We all know it was Judas' greed that led him to betray Jesus, to be used by Satan as an instrument. But it was not beyond Jesus. Let me show you this passage as I draw to a close tonight to help us to focus on the cross of Jesus Christ. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. I am not sure how do we digest that, that verse. When you know someone is going to betray you, do you tell everybody, I know who's going to betray me? Or do you just eliminate that person that was going to betray you in a short while? His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, 
the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one is him, which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? You see, listen to this. Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. It wasn't Judas who finally took the initiative first to say, this is the man that I have sold for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knew. He said, here, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the sign, the son of Simon is carried as a sign of surrender. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. Jesus was so certain of the love of the Father. Jesus was so certain of the assignment that God has given to him that he was confident to the end. Satan did not force Jesus on the cross. Jesus was not hung on the cross because of our sin. He was not there out of control. Jesus dipped the bread and gave it to Judas. He was hung on the cross because of his love for us. He gave up his life. He gave up his life for us. And then in verse 34, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And so tonight, as this year we do not want to just do the production that we normally do, but to help us really look at our lives, to look at the situation that we are in, the work that we are in, the relationship that we are in, the studies that we are in. How close are we to Jesus? What is this Good Friday all about? Is it just another Christian festival? Is it helping us to draw nearer to experience Christ? It is not just for ourselves to experience the cross. Jesus, at the end of it, says, this is the new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. Love one another because I've shown you how much I love you by humbling myself and washing your feet. Love one another. Tonight, it is impossible for us to love one another unless we have first experienced the love of Jesus for us. Tonight, you come to church. I, I don't want us to just want to see the lights, the music. I want us to really learn, to draw close and to experience Jesus. I want us to close our eyes. Thank you for checking out our online sermon. If the message has truly impacted and uh, empowered your life. It is my desire that you sow into the work of our church so that you can partner with us as we continually reach out to our world for Jesus Christ and extend the arms of love of Christ. So if you're giving, you can give online or you can do a direct transfer and all the information that you need is on the screen. So God bless you and thank you for partnering with us.